Good morning. My name is Rahul Agarwal, a GU medical oncologist at UCSF. Thank you everyone for joining. Over the next few minutes, I will give a brief overview of systemic treatment options for patients with a rising PSA after prior surgery and or radiation. We'll start with a brief case example that highlights the scenario we will be discussing. This was an actual patient of mine, a 68 year old male with Gleason 4 plus 4 prostate cancer diagnosed in 2018. He underwent surgery followed by radiation. His PSA was undetectable, but then subsequently started to rise, crossing the 0.2 threshold that defines biochemical or PSA recurrence. At a PSA level of 0.8, he underwent a PSMA PET scan, which did not demonstrate any PET added lesions. And therefore, he was not a candidate for metastasis directed therapy. Not detecting a spot on PSMA PET happens about one third of the time with a PSA level between 0.5 and 1. At this point, what are the treatment options for this patient with a rising PSA? Risk stratification is key. For those with low risk, surveillance is a very appropriate option and delays the side effects and toxicities that can be associated with androgen deprivation therapy. For higher risk situations, hormonal therapy is likely warranted at some point. But pertinent questions remain, such as when to start, and for how long should we treat, and what type of hormone therapy should we give. The best way to risk stratify between low and high risk situations is to use the PSA doubling time. This is easy to calculate with readily available online tools. These are the results from a long-term study of natural history following patients with rising PSA after surgery. The prostate cancer specific survival is shown along the X axis, starting from the time of PSA recurrence meaning when the PSA rose above 0.2. With time, the proportion surviving drops from 100% across all groups. However, you can see for those patients with the slowest PSA doubling time of greater than 15 months, as represented by the top curve, the vast majority of patients were alive 15 years from recurrence without any additional treatment. In those with the shortest PSA doubling times of less than three months, the risk of prostate cancer mortality is much higher in the absence of treatment with a median survival of approximately five years. It is important to emphasize that this was a natural history study, meaning that these patients did not receive treatment for PSA relapse. It was also a group of men enrolled multiple decades ago and survival outcomes, outcomes for patients with prostate cancer have significantly improved since then. But nevertheless, the separation of the survival curve shown in the graph on the previous slide demonstrates the utility of the PSA doubling time to risk stratify patients into low and high risk groups. Generally speaking, a PSA doubling time of nine months is often used as a cut point to distinguish these groups. For our higher risk patients with a shorter PSA doubling time, when is the right time to start hormone therapy? There really is not a one-size-fits-all approach to this question. Several studies have demonstrated that earlier rather than delayed hormone therapy, particularly before the distant dis development of distant metastases on a scan, likely benefits patients. Our general practice here at UCSF is to aim to start androgen deprivation therapy somewhere in the range of a PSA between 3 to 10 nanograms per milliliter. But this depends on many factors. We discussed the importance of PSA doubling time, and additional factors include the absolute PSA level, patient preference, including their experience on prior hormonal therapy, as well as patients' medical conditions, including history of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and overall estimated life expectancy. For those patients who start on hormone therapy, what is the optimal duration of treatment? Should we give hormone therapy continuously until resistance, or should we do so intermittently? in which we give androgen deprivation for a fixed duration of time, typically in the nine to 12 month range. And then if the PSA is suppressed, we stop treatment. And then as the PSA starts to rise at a pre-specified time point, we start treatment again. We now have very solid data from a large randomized phase three study that tells us that intermittent hormone therapy has similar long-term survival as continuous therapy, yet with fewer side effects, better quality of life, and potentially a longer time until hormone resistance. Shown on the right is the Kaplan-Meier survival curves from this phase three study. 
As you can see, the two arms are nearly overlapping when it comes to long-term survival outcomes, meaning similar outcomes with either approach, but better quality of life with intermittent therapy. Generally speaking, for our patients we treat here at UCSF, we give intermittent hormone therapy for a period somewhere between nine to 12 months, and then we stop and we watch and follow both the PSA and testosterone during the surveillance phase. The next question that comes is what type of hormone therapy can be given for patients with a rise in PSA? The most common type of EDT is Lupron or equivalent brand. There are alternatives, however, including the LHRH antagonists such as Degarelix or more recently, the newly FDA approved oral medication Relagolix. Both Degarelix and Relagolix lower testosterone more rapidly than Lupron. However, longer term disease control appears to be similar with all of these different treatments. One potential difference between Lupron and Relagolix is highlighted in the phase three study comparing these two medications as shown on the right side of the slide. In this study, they randomized men to receive either Relagolix or Lupron and treated patients for a period of 12 months and then stopped as part of an intermittent treatment approach. They then measured the time until testosterone recovery as shown in the plot on the screen. As you can see, the time to testosterone recovery was faster with Relagolix compared with Lupron, shown on the orange curve for Relagolix versus the blue curve for Lupron. So for patients for whom we're planning intermittent hormone therapy, who wish to have a more rapid testosterone recovery following treatment break, this is potentially an option to consider. There are also techniques to avoid testosterone lowering therapy altogether and instead block the testosterone receptor. We call this peripheral androgen blockade and often use a medicine such as bicalutamide or Casidex alone for this approach. There are trade-offs with this approach, potentially fewer side effects, including sexual side effects compared to Lupron, but a higher rate of breast enlargement and nipple tenderness, and uncertainty whether intermittent treatment with peripheral blockade leads to similar disease control off treatment as we see with Lupron. One question that often comes up is whether or not we should add a second generation hormonal agent such as abiraterone to patients with a rising PSA. Currently, there are no strong clinical trial data to support this approach, although there are several ongoing phase three studies underway. One exception to this rule is for the patient who has a rising PSA, no distant metastases on conventional imaging, such as a CT scan and bone scan, but who has multiple distant metastases on a PET scan, such as an axiom or PSMA PET. In this case, there are too many lesions to consider for metastasis-directed radiation. And a reasonable argument can be made to intensify hormonal therapy with a combination of Lupron plus a second generation hormonal agent, such as abiraterone, enzalutamide, or apalutamide. So our take home points are the following. The PSA doubling time is a very useful and quick way to risk stratify patients who have a rising PSA after surgery and or radiation. Surveillance is completely acceptable for approach for patients with those who have a slow doubling time. And this potentially allows the ability to have a repeat PSMA PET scan at a slightly higher PSA level when the likelihood of detection may be higher and may offer the opportunity for metastasis directed therapy. For patients who are with higher risk disease who need to start hormone therapy, the data support intermittent rather than continuous hormonal therapy as the standard of care. The decision on when to start depends on many factors. And generally, I don't recommend treatment intensification with combination hormonal therapy for rising PSA patients only, except those with multiple lesions detected on PET imaging. With that, I will wrap up. Thank you very much for your attention.